I'd like to start out by uh, talking, addressing some of the issues that John raised. Primarily, I think they're very appropriate for a talk on dopamine, because one problem with reductionism in neuroscience is our tendency to ascribe a psychological experience, event, or variable to a single brain region or a single neurotransmitter, and dopamine has been the recipient of a lot of that. Many of you may have think of dopamine as the love neurotransmitter or the reward feel-good neurotransmitter. All of these kinds of ideas that are propagated through uh, popular press based on an oversimplification. And so today I hope to give you some um, idea from work in the lab with rodents on how dopamine instead might work to impact our behavior and that it's not as simple or in fact is not a love juice that makes you feel good. <laughs> Uh, in other parts of the talk, there may be some things where I'll have to ask John to turn his back because I will mention the word optogenetics, just telling you. In fact, I'm showing you experiments from that. Apologies in advance. <laughs> so uh, imagine that, like I yesterday, imagine that you're walking into a bookstore. So I went to the bookstore yesterday with my daughter, and I really enjoy bookstores. And I walked towards the first table with all the new books, picked it up. I could smell that new book smell. My cafe also has, my bookstore also has a cafe. And so I, I walk to the back and I, I smell the coffee, I hear the sound of the milk being foamed, I walk up to the display and see that apple turnover that I like so much and point at it, give money to the clerk, get that apple turnover, eat it, enjoy it. So what I'm mentioning to you um, is my experience walking into this bookstore to show you about, to, to give an example of sensory events that have not a neutral sort of feel to them, but instead are imbued with some sort of positive value, right? So each of these events are associated with something good. I love reading, so new book smell. I love eating the apple tart. I like to see that apple tart. And so it's clear that when we move through our environment, we and other organisms evaluate the sensory input and not based just on what they might mean from a sort of factual perspective, but also these different sensory stimuli have different shades of good or bad value. And this, of course, is important for our adaptive behavior. You have to know what to do as you move through the environment. You have to recognize food and get it and eat it. You have to stay away from threatening things in the environment. We also know that these kinds of stimuli can uh, in affect how we allocate our attention. They can affect our mood. They can bias our decisions. So it's important to understand how different sensory stimuli become imbued with value and how they impact our behavior. And so dopamine is one neurotransmitter that I'm going to give you some evidence for as important in at least part of this process. And of course, this process of learning about events and cues in, in the environment um, has been studied by psychologists for a very long time. And you can call some of the means by which we learn this Pavlovian conditioning and instrumental conditioning, two types of associations that most of you have probably heard about in psychology class in college, or perhaps you work on that now because you are a psychologist or a neuroscientist or you study animal behavior. And I, the first thing I want to show you to put you in a good mood, so you're more receptive to all my slides, is a, a very interesting example of not humans using these associations, but the um, whoop, advance. There we go. The canonical cat video, the cute cat video. So here these cats, of course, have learned actions that result in positive outcomes. They've learned what the different stimuli in the environment mean, and they use this learning to help organize their behavior in very cute but adaptive ways. They're getting that food that, that they wish so much. That's so adorable. <laughs> now we don't... Uh, <laughs> Very, very smart cat. So our model is not quite so complex. <laughs> we have an even simpler model in the laboratory that I'll show you in a minute that we use to try to ask questions about how uh, dopamine neurons within the brain may contribute to this process of ascribing value to sensory stimuli. And so where's my pointer? There it is. And so in this cartoon of the reward circuitry in the human brain, we see lots of brain regions that are involved in these kinds of associative processes. There's not just one 
neurotransmitter or one region. There are many different things you learn when you associate stimuli with outcomes or when you learn to make specific actions to get an outcome. But today we're going to focus on dopamine neurons in the midbrain, in the ventral tegmental area, and the substantia nigra uh, here and here. And these areas provide the major dopaminergic input to the striatum, which is a very large part of our brain and includes its most ventral aspect, the nucleus accumbens, the VTA projects to the nucleus accumbens, and the dorsal striatum, also known as the caudate putamen, that the substantia nigra projects to. So we know what dopamine neurons do in response to cues and to rewards, because a long time ago, people, uh, Wolfram Schultz recorded from the brains of primates uh, when they received rewards and when these rewards were predicted by a cue in the environment. And so if you look over here to the right, you see the response of one neuron, and you see that when they, this animal gets reward that's not predicted, the neuron fires in a burst of activity, this increase right here. This is each trial, each time the animal received reward. This is the average of all the different times. When the reward's fully predicted by a cue, the animals learn that the cue predicts the reward, the neuron doesn't change its responding. So you see already this is not an obligatory readout of the presence of the reward, so it can't just be about the sensory qualities about the reward. It's something else. And indeed, when the reward's expected and it doesn't come, the neuron shows a pause in firing. So this increase in activity and decrease in activity, when the reward comes when the animal doesn't know it's going to come, or when reward fails to come, is similar or parallel to this concept of reward prediction error, which was an idea that came about from animal learning models and from computer science about what might drive learning. So when there's an error in what you predicted, if you get something you didn't expect, you should learn about that. If it's something good or bad, you need to learn about the cues that preceded that or the actions you made that resulted in that outcome. So the more, the more you're learning uh, can be driven. So dopamine neurons uh, seem to act like at least part of the signaling in the brain of reward prediction error. So uh, what we would like to do is see if we can have, find evidence for this hypothesis. The hypothesis then would be that dopamine neuron activity at the time of reward delivery can promote learning about the antecedent events. So a, a prediction error in real life, something that you didn't expect, can drive dopamine activity that causes some learning to happen. And so what I can tell you is that over the last years, uh, my lab and in and other labs have used a number of techniques to manipulate dopamine neuron function and make fake reward prediction errors and drive learning or inhibit learning. And so it seems that, on the face of it, this uh, theory is supported. We have good data for this. But the question that still remains and that we've been interested in is what is it that animals learn from this dopamine reward prediction behave, uh, signal, reward prediction error signal? And by what, I mean by what kinds of behavioral changes are induced uh, by this procedure? And why are there different dopaminergic subgroups? So there's the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra. If we go back to this cartoon of the human brain, we have these two different dopamine subgroups in the midbrain projecting to the striatum. Do they have different functions? We know that their target regions in the striatum have different functions. So it would make sense. On the other hand, when you just record the neural activity, when rewards are presented or cues are presented in the dopamine neurons, you see cue responses all over. You see reward responses all over. What, what does that mean? Why is that? What might the variability be for? Now here I'm just showing you a cartoon of a rat brain to now orient us uh, to, the, to the rat, uh, again making the point that there are um, different, there it is. Different groups of dopamine neurons in the midbrain, this is the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra, and they project to different territories in the striatum. VTA projects to nucleus accumbens, substantia nigra projects to dorsal striatum. And so we want to turn to these kinds of learning, Pavlovian conditioning and instrumental conditioning, that shape the way we and other organisms interact with our environment moment by moment. So we learn what different stimuli mean, and we learn the outcome of our actions. And so we're going to do this in the laboratory using the rat. The rat's in a, a behavioral chamber. And normally, for Pavlovian conditioning, we could present this rat with a nice yellow light cue and follow that by a food reward. And over time, 
he would learn that the queue predicts reward and go and, and gather the reward when the queue comes on. Likewise, for instrumental conditioning, the animal could press the lever and then receive a piece of food, and he could learn that pressing the lever delivers the food, is reinforced by the food. In the beginning of learning, if this idea about dopamine is correct, when the animal first receives a food after the cue, it's surprising. He didn't expect it. Dopamine neurons should fire. Likewise, when the animal receives food after an action. So if, if food was delivered and it was not predicted, it was unexpected, we would expect some dopamine neurons to show this brief increase in activity in both cases. If we want to know, in this case, what the role of this dopamine neuron activity is, uh, we would like to isolate this experimentally. We are going to remove the actual real food and leave in its place just the dopamine neuron signaling and have this really pared down version of Pavlovian conditioning and instrumental conditioning. So we will follow cues with dopamine neuron activation and actions with dopamine neuron activation. Very, very simple. And you might ask, how can we do that? How can we control what the dopamine neurons do? And this is when John has to turn his back because it's via optogenetics. <laughs> so optogenetics, for some of you that uh, may not be familiar with it, is an approach based on uh, genetics that allows you to express a, diff a special kind of ion channel in a given neuron type. So we can express, for instance, in this case, the channel rhodopsin uh, channel in dopamine neurons. And this channel is light sensitive. So if you shine light on neurons expressing this channel in their membrane, you make them fire. So you can control the timing of when you make neurons fire, certain kinds of neurons in certain places in the brain during behavior. And so what's interesting about this for people interested in behavior, this means we can um, make the neurons do things relative to different times uh, when the animal's behaving. And so that's the appeal from the point of view of an animal psychologist. And so here uh, you see dopamine neurons uh, in the midbrain that are expressing channel rhodopsin. These are these orange neurons here. And then when we shine light on them via laser, we can make them uh, uh, fire a, tra a train of action potentials. And then we can look and see what the resultant effect is on behavior. And so if we first turn to Pavlovian conditioning, this is a question that was addressed by Ben Saunders, a postdoc in the lab. And what Ben asked is whether or not just dopamine neuron stimulation itself following the cue could attribute some sort of positive value to that cue. So is that the function of dopamine neuron activation? And he's going to compare substantia nigra dopamine activation with VTA dopamine neuron activation in different groups of animals. And so he's going to infuse a virus into these different subregions of the brain so that this light-sensitive channel will be expressed in dopamine neurons, and then he can turn them on when he wants to. And so the actual experiment involved a seven-second presentation of a cue, followed by five-second stimulation of dopamine neurons. There's always a control group in a Pavlovian study where you have the cue and the unconditioned stimulus unpaired to make sure that whatever happens is really due to the pairing of the two. And the cue in this case is both a light and a sound. So the animal's in a, in a box, an animal chamber. There's a light a few uh, inches up above the floor that the animal could reach if he sniffed, and then he hears a cue. Uh, an auditory cue at the same time. And then for 12 days, for a few hours a day, the cue and the stimulation are paired, and they're videotaping the animal. And then Ben asked, what, what does the animal do? There's no food reward. The animal's never gotten food reward here. There's no drug reward. There's just the cue and dopamine neuron stimulation. And so what he found is that when he looked at the videos, over days, rats, when the cues come on, tend to approach the location of the cue as soon as it comes on with greater probability. So here over 12 sessions, you see an increased probability that the animal approaches the cue and comes within one inch of it when the cue comes on. And you don't see this in the unpaired animals or in animals not expressing this rhodopsin. So this is a learned behavior without any real natural reward at all. And it's very specific. It's approaching the cue that's been paired with dopamine neuron activity. On the other hand, for substantia nigra dopamine neurons, you don't see any evidence of cue approach at all. So if you pair this cue with stimulating the other group of dopamine neurons, that doesn't happen at all. The animal does not approach the cue. And in both cases, in the unpaired groups, there's no 
uh, increase in Q approach over time. What do substantial Nigra animals do? They actually do learn to make behaviors in response to the Q as well. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is our manipulation is only on one side of the brain. It's unilateral. And so many of the neuroscientists and neurologists in the audience will know that if you increase dopamine activity on one side of the brain in the caudate or the dorsal striatum, you induce contralateral circling. So in fact, over days, animals began to show a conditioned contralateral rotation in the substantia nigra animals, not directed towards the cue. So that was pretty interesting. I'm not going to focus on that part today, because today I'm very interested in what's happening in the, in the VTA animals. Again, the VTA animals show this increase in approach. And just as, as an aside, they also do show an increase in rotation over days that starts a little bit after the approach comes on. But that detail is less important for now. So if we've been, if we've somehow, you know, been able to uh, tap into this natural learning process mediated by dopamine, then we should see the development of a neural response to the cue that dopamine neurons usually show when the cue is followed by a real reward, a real food reward. And so to address this question, we had to use a, a different virus, a couple, two viruses in fact, and use a technique called fiber photometry that allows you to measure calcium activity in dopamine neurons. The calcium activity is a proxy for neural activity, for spiking. And at the same time, those are the same neurons that we're actually forcing to fire with the optogenetics. So in this experiment, Ben and now Jocelyn Richard, also in the lab, are exposing animals to a cue and then optogenetically activating dopamine neurons, and at the same time recording the response of the dopamine neurons to the cue and the optogenetic activation. If this is like a, a, the normal learning process, we would expect over time a cue response to occur in these dopamine neurons, even though we're not stimulating at the time the cue comes on. And in fact, this is exactly what they saw. So first of all, the learning occurred, at, again, as it had before. So animals are more likely to approach the cue over days when cue and activation are associated. So we replicate the first effect. And if you look here at this time zero, that's when the cue comes on. The cue's on for two seconds before we drive the dopamine neurons. You can see in blue and then later in pink, and it's easier to see in this blow up, that the response to the cue is, gets much bigger, both in uh, amplitude and in duration over training. This is exactly what you see if this had been a natural reward conditioning experiment, which we've also done. So the response, these neurons began, begin responding to this cue that's been paired with dopamine stimulation. They also, the animals began to approach the cue. And for dopamine tornadoes, we also in this system do see the equivalent of a negative reward prediction error. We, if we have trials where we leave out the dopamine neuron stimulation, we get an amazing inhibition at the time that it would have been expected. That's just an aside. So because the cue elicits approach behavior, we can propose that this cue has acquired some kind of value. It's attractive to the animal now. It somehow can motivate uh, its behavior. And this is occurring just by virtue of pairing with dopamine neuron firing. And cues that have acquired positive value can act as rewards themselves. And so this is a phenomenon that's been known for in animal behavior for quite a long time. This is the phenomenon of conditioned reinforcement, whereby a cue that predicted another reward can itself act as a reward and support the acquisition of new behaviors. So for example, animals can learn to lever press just for the cue as the reward. So uh, we wanted to ask if this was true for this cue that we've conditioned just with dopamine neuron stimulation. So would, is this cue also able to serve as a secondary or conditioned reinforcer? And is there a difference? with the VTA versus the substantia nigra. And how do we do this? So these are the same animals that already were trained in this manner. So we have the cue followed by dopamine neuron activation. This is the Pavlovian conditioning phase. Then we have a second phase where now we have levers in the chamber. The animal can press the levers. One of the levers delivers the cue. He hears the cue. He sees the cue. And you just ask whether or not the animal will learn to press the lever for the cue. And in fact, that is what happens for VTA animals. So when the cue was paired with dopamine stimulation in the VTA, prior to this test, 
animals will learn a new response reinforced by that cue. In fact, it's really nice responding for this kind of test uh, in rats. And, the not, and that is not true for the substantia nigra animals. No evidence for the cue having enough positive value to support learning a new behavior. And we've also done other experiments using viruses and other tricks to reduce the number of neurons that we're affecting, dopamine neurons, to just those that project to specific parts of the striatum. And we know this one ability for dopamine to ascribe motivational value in this way uh, to cues is just uh, by stimulating dopamine neurons that project to the nucleus accumbens core. And that's what these data show, which I won't go into. So if we do Pavlovian conditioning with dopamine neuron stimulation, we can induce, when it's the VTA that's stimulated, conditioned approach to a cue, and that cue also will act as a reward in and of itself. On the other hand, with the substantia nigra, we can sort of invigorate motor activity we see with the circling behavior, but it's not focused towards a given cue. And so there's a lot more to study and understand about what's happening on the substantia nigra side. Uh, and that's something that we're very interested in still doing. But the VTA result was especially interesting because in this case, the cue then was able to motivate specific behaviors directed toward getting the cue, either going to the cue or working for the cue. And, and if you're wondering why would there be a system that would do that, well, cues generally signal the availability of a reward. So the cue, the color red of the strawberry is where the strawberry is. So it's actually quite logical. Okay, whoops. And so these uh, ideas that we uh, emerge from out of this Pavlovian conditioning, very simple Pavlovian conditioning procedure, can inform and give us new ideas about how we think about instrumental conditioning and the role of these two different groups of dopamine neurons. Um, we can test this instrumental conditioning uh, idea the same way by substituting dopamine for the natural reward. So we will do that. And Ronald Keiflin, a postdoc in the lab, uh, conducted these studies. And in this type of study, now when the animal presses a lever, instead of getting a piece of food, it's getting activation via optogenetics of dopamine neurons for brief time periods. So that becomes the substitute for the reward. And because of these different findings in the Pavlovian situation, we can uh, suggest that these two pathways should contribute to instrumental responding differently. And so if, if uh, VTA dopamine activity can support learning about the value of a sensory stimulus, then it can support learning of value of many of the sensory stimuli. And your evaluation of your current uh, context is sometimes called your evaluation of your state. So there's an idea that this system can encode or help you learn your state value. So your state value is just given to you by, among other things, the value of the stimuli in the environment. On the other hand, the substantia nigra did not seem to be able to support this kind of cue learning, any kind of learning about the, the larger aspect of the likelihood of reward in a given state. It was just learning uh, some kind of motor movement. And so this led Ronald to propose that the substantia nigra system maybe can support learning and action immediately reduced by a reward, but that the VTA system should be able to uh, help animals learn about a more complicated, a more complex sequence of instrumental behaviors that require animals to understand the possible reward that could emerge from a given state and the relation among states. And so what he hypothesized was that VTA stimulation Animals can learn both Pavlovian state values and instrumental actions, but with substantia nigra stimulation, uh, they can't learn the Pavlovian state values, only the instrumental actions. And some of this could simply be reflected in the behavior where in the Pavlovian case, we know animals can learn to approach a cue that's predictive of a reward. In this case, it could be the lever, whereas in the substantia nigra case, that approach was missing. So the, he designed many studies to look at this, and I'll just tell you about one of those now because I think this one is really interesting. And so he proposed that because of this ability to uh, think about uh, the state, the value of a given state and the interactions between states, 
that VTA dopamine neuron stimulation should support sequence learning. So animals learning a sequence of instrumental actions instead of just one single action, like one lever press. Because in reality, usually we do learn a sequence of actions for a given outcome, not just a single um, action. And so in this uh, chain instrumental procedure that he developed, first he chained animals for three days on chain length one, press the lever, get zapped dopamine neurons. Then after three days of that, a few hours a day, animals go into three days of the next uh, phase of the chain. Now uh, the initial lever is, is in, here we go, is in, and a second lever is extended. When animals press the second lever, that one goes in, and the first lever comes out, they can press that lever and get stimulation. So there's only reward or dopamine neuron stimulation after the final lever press. But now he has to press two levers in sequence. And then after three days, the final phase, the animal has to put his nose in a hole on the other side of the cage. That causes the second lever to come out. He presses that lever. That causes the first lever to come out, and he gets the stimulation. You see how it's building up. He has to do three actions by the end. Seems like it shouldn't be that hard, but there's no actual real reward. There's just a little dopamine neuron stimulation on one side of the brain in either the VTA or the substantia nigra. And what happens is that when this stimulation is in the VTA, um, and VTA animals can learn all three phases of this. When the stimulation is in the substantia nigra, they can't progress beyond the first phase. So that was really interesting to us. And that's what you see here. Here is the uh, group data. Here's phase one, uh, purple and blue. Purple is the substantia nigra animals, blue, the VTA animals. All animals can learn to make one action to get stimulation of their dopamine neurons. But when you ask them to make another action for access to the lever for the first action, only VTA animals can learn that. And only VTA animals can then also learn a sequence of three. So substantia nigra animals are just seem more, much more impoverished in, in their learning in this. So using both kinds of really elementary associations that we use to navigate the world to get to the things that we need, positive outcomes, and to avoid uh, negative outcomes, we see very different effects in stimulating the VTA and the substantia nigra. And so in the VTA, we saw conditioned approach to cues predictive of dopamine stimulation. We saw that those cues then will support new learning. They act as rewards themselves. We see in instrumental learning that stimulation in the VTA supports one action, continuous reinforcement, but also supports learning chains, novel chains of instrumental actions. Substantia nigra dopamine stimulation uh, doesn't do that. So there are differences in what reward prediction error signals do in different parts of the striatum. So these are different groups of dopamine neurons that project to different parts of the striatum. And so you might ask, well, why are there differences? What, what does that matter? The brain works as a whole. And so one way to think about how to put this all back together, one thing that I didn't tell you about in the beginning, is that these two systems are interconnected. So this sort of uh, ventral VTA system that seems to have a larger view, it learns about state values and can learn about relationships between different states in time here, is a system that um, has within it this substantia nigra dorsal striatum system sort of embedded. So this is a, a very, a maybe confusing, but really simplifying diagram of the anatomy of dopamine and striatal systems in the brain. Dopamine neurons in the VTA project to the ventral striatum, and the ventral striatum projects back to some different dopamine neurons in the midbrain that project back to a different part of the striatum, and so on and so on. It's a spiral but it only goes one way, from ventral to dorsal. So normally, a, re a reward, a real reward, could engage all of these different parts of the striatum and engage all of the different sub-processes that they uh, may control. And when we go in there with this artificial way of just zapping a few neurons, we think we're looking at a little piece of that. Of course, when we zap the VTA neurons, because of this structure, this an anatomical structure, we think we're recruiting these other circuits and recruiting substantia nigra processes too, and that's something that we're interested in trying to show experimentally in the near future. So I've, I've tried to show you today that different dopaminergic regions seem to 
um, have distinct roles in these very simple kinds of learning. And that phasic activity or brief in time activity of dopamine neurons can act like a reward prediction error and drive learning about antecedent events. But the content of that learning for these different cell groups seems to be different. And this is in agreement with a literature that already existed about what different striatal circuits uh, do and how they may contribute to behavior. And in their most elemental form, these conditioned responses that we induced and that we talked about today don't require information about the sensory aspects of the reward. So we took that away. So normally when you, when the animal or when you get a reward and eat it, all kinds of things are happening in your nervous system. It's a very rich processing. We tried to just skim away all that, just skim onto the top of that and just look at the con contribution of dopamine neuron activation with this very uh, simplified procedure. And so we think that this is showing us something fundamental about what the dopamine systems do, in particular the VTA dopamine system, and that it's geared towards learning about sensory stimuli that, that signal the availability of reward. So it's not a feeling of reward itself necessarily. It's learning about the conditions in the environment that predict reward availability. And these map onto default sets of processes that you would have to learn to successfully navigate the world, right? You have to go to the food that you recognize sensorily. You smell it or you see it, etc. And so because we're in this very interesting uh, symposium today where I have to try to relate this neuroscience, this rats and chambers and getting their brains out to larger issues of our human experience, I just wanted to have a little slide about implications. Of course, I'm looking to you all to really tell me about what you think the implications of these might be. Um, in my field already, many people look at how dopamine systems regulate responses to cues um, and are interested in how that applies to uh, pathologies of um, under-responsiveness to cues or over-responsiveness to cues in addiction and depression and overeating. So those are sort of applications that you could probably see would be natural fallouts of this work. Uh, but what might be interesting to think about in light of today's symposium is whether or not any of this sort of very simple means of evaluating cues in the environment and directing behavior uh, based on cues could apply to uh, natural learning and normal learning, whether it's outside the classroom or inside the classroom. So could this somehow uh, be used to increase learning success, maybe simply by affecting mood? Could it be used to inform us about uh, social interactions? If we think about social reward, could this be used um, in a more practical sense when we think about using uh, devices to aid in learning? So we already know that entities like Google or Facebook uh, use ideas like this when they think about the colors that they're going to make, the cues and the apps and things like that. Um, and so that's, that's just an open question. I don't know the answer to that at, at this point. And that's where I wanted to end. I want to make sure to thank my lab members who um, did the work, Ron, Jocelyn, and Ben, and thank my collaborators in funding, and especially you, uh, for listening. That's a great question, and I do not know the answer to that. Um, and I and I don't I don't have any speculation. So I think the closest we have for humans, and get it, we get subjective reports from humans, including in controlled laboratory experiments when they're given drugs that activate dopamine systems, so when they're given methylphenidate or methamphetamine, et cetera, but that's not really what we want to know. We want to know what the effect of actual stimulation of the dopamine neurons, quote unquote, you know, feels like. And we, we don't know, as far as I know, unless someone knows of some human work that I'm not aware of. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. We want our students to learn in schools. Yes. They don't get much of a positive feedback. What do you think would happen if at the end of a year 
The student with an A average got $100. The student with a B average got $50, and so on. It would cost us much, not cost very much, and would be, a, I think, a real inducement. I mean, I worked real hard when my dad would give me a dime <laughs> for an A. I think that there is value in thinking about the effect of reinforcement in learning. And I believe there probably is a literature on this. I see some nods over there from my colleagues that, that know more about how this is translated into the classroom. And I, I'm, sh I'm sure it's, I would be very surprised if positive reinforcement did not have some, have some sort of positive effect, whether it's just money or whether it's even verbal, positive feedback, verbal encouragement, et cetera. So I, I don't know if you want to speak to this now or. Amy Shelton, my colleague from education. Just very, very briefly, the key there would be asking what kind of reward. So things like monetary rewards have shown to be pretty ineffective in most educational populations. Now, that may not be true in all. So there's going to be a huge context effect. And you have to be really careful about um, the impact of extrinsic versus intrinsic kinds of motivation, especially um, in the K-12 space. Interesting. Um, hey. Hi. I'm wondering um, about the diversity in types of learning, right? So we're saying Pavlovian conditioning or instrumental or, um, does that exhaust the list? And if it does, why is it sufficient? What is, what, is the, what is the complexity of learning that's faced by a creature such that this would suffice? I do not think that this is the, accounts for all of learning at all. This is very um, reduced but critical sort of learning space that really I think is important for our basically moment by moment behavior. So clearly there are other kinds of more complex learning that go on. And I'm actually really interested in, in uh, thinking about the interactions between, for instance, traditional episodic memory systems and these kinds of more basic, you know, low level low-level learning systems. And I'm not sure of that much work that actually is, 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 has looked at that from the neuroscience perspective or from other perspectives. Uh, but I think that would be interesting to know. Instead, it seems like we study our different systems in isolation uh, when clearly you know, the brain is one thing working together as a whole. And so thinking about how these different parts interact, I think, would be potentially beneficial. And so if, if we're thinking this could help learning in the classroom, then that's means that we assume there's some beneficial interaction. And so I don't know. I, I see someone in the back. Hi. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so you showed when you were simulating the VTA and adding like a chain of um, tasks, they always occurred before the previous rewarded cue. Can you add them intermediate between the currently rewarded oh. cue and the reward? That's and a good cause idea. Cause those to become rewarded? Yeah. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of an, an instance where that has occurred. It, probably people have tried that with natural reward, and I'm sure Dr. Holland would know that if he were here. Um, that, I think that's a good idea, and I don't know the answer to that. But it, if it hasn't been done, that seems interesting to do. Do you uh, know if the mechanism for negative reinforcers is the same or different? And if so, does it suggest that there are generalized learnings about states in which we might expect positive versus negative reinforcers? That's a really good question and one that's very sort of hot in the dopamine field right now. And it's really, it's really not clear. So at least for dopamine systems, it may be that it's most involved in learning where the animal and the organism needs to move towards the event. And so that those necessarily are rewarding events. And learning to move away from something that also involves a series of actions could still be the same, use the same mechanism, but, but we don't know that yet. Um, certainly, uh, and one thing I want to make sure to make clear, this is not the only system that's engaged when we and other animals are learning about the relationship between cues in the environment and their outcomes, be they good or bad. There's lots of different interacting systems. But how the dopamine system in particular uh, contributes when uh, the outcome is negative, I think is not, it's, it's a really hot area of investigation right now. It's not clear. Oh. One more. 
says the boss. Um, you know, it's brought up with, with students, there's a difference between internal and external motivations. Um, you know, I think anybody who's owned a dog can, can tell you that dogs appear to have uh, intrinsic motivation in some of their behaviors. Uh, do rats ever, are, are they ever intrinsically motivated and, and would there be any way on a neural level to distinguish between the in, internal and exter, ex, ex, intrinsic and extrinsic motivations? Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly can do that by changing motivational state in a crude way, like making them hungry or something like this. And in animal models of addiction, for example, animals are certainly motivated to get the drug when they've had past experience with the drug. So, so I think we could start to get a hold on that, on that kind of thing and compare. And then the question, one question would be, how does this engage some of these systems I've been talking about that are responsive to cues in the environment and is there some overlap? Yeah, I think that's great. Okay. <laughs>